Hello everyone and welcome back to the podcast. Today we're going to be doing an update on my Meta thesis. Meta's Q2 2024 earnings report basically suggests that we are not in an AI bubble. Also, the asymmetry that I pointed out in my original Meta thesis is only starting to play out with the stock up 415% since. Let's get deep into it. At present, Meta's business consists primarily in increasing engagement and finding new ways to monetize and engagement more effectively over time. In my last meta update, I explained how the company saw an 8 to 10% increase in total time watched for reels just by shifting towards a unified AI model architecture. This shift was for reels only, and as of Q2 2024, the company has shifted towards a single AI model architecture for all of its video players across all of its apps. We can expect this architecture to yield similar gains across the other apps, and therefore, my conclusion is is that AI is definitely driving value creation across Meta's network, which means that AI is already a productive technology. In the Q2 2024 earnings call, Suck said that Llama 4, the next iteration of the current model, Llama 3, will require 10 times more compute than Llama 3 at present. What caught my eye is that only one iteration of the model requires an order of magnitude more of compute power. Indeed, if LLMs, large language models, don't stop scaling anytime soon, this is going to drive exponential growth in the chip sector for the foreseeable future. In the latest AMD event, CEO Lisa Su explained that the Llama 3.1 model, the one that Meta is currently running across its platforms, is running exclusively on the MI300 chip, which is AMD's competitor to the H200, and it's running exclusively on the MI300 for live traffic only. Thus, Meta's advancements also suggest that my hypothesis when I wrote my original AMD deep dive that indeed AMD was going to take market share from Nvidia is playing out too. Hello everyone and welcome back to the podcast. Today we're going to be doing an, that they were betting the house in the metaverse. Meta was actually investing in the infrastructure required to create a highly fungible data center infrastructure. This setup allows them to capitalize on the highest ROI opportunities as they emerge by essentially enabling them to tweak the entire AI stack, from the hardware to the models to the end applications, in order to ultimately maximize the performance of the entire stack. An example of this is the aforementioned shift towards a single model architecture for videos. Indeed, this underlying mechanism is likely to have Meta unlocking more value from AI rather than less over time. And so the impression that I get when analyzing Meta's Q2 2024 earnings call is that AI is real. It's driving real business value and the future that's not not too far away implies AI delivering much, much more value than at present and requiring much more compute capacity than at the moment. In the Q2 earnings call, Suck also mentioned that many of Meta's new AI powered apps, or essentially AI apps, basically that's what they are, are built on Llama 3. And this has notable long term implications. But before we get into that, check out what Suck said about those during the Q2 2024 earnings call. So Llama is the foundation model that people can shape into all kinds of different products. So whether it's meta AI for ourselves or the AI studio or the business agents or like the assistant that's in the Ray-Ban glasses, like all these different things are basically products that have been built with Llama. And similarly, any developer out there is going to be able to take it and build a whole greater diversity of different things as well. Fundamentally, what this means is that Meta's AI endeavors are shaping up to be fractal, meaning that the number of sub-models that can emerge from the parent model, the parent AI model, is endless. Zuckerberg's vision is for anyone to be able to create their own AI model, including businesses and content creators. These models will be able to automate any process that Meta sees happening across its network repeatedly, such as conversations with customers, followers, and more. More importantly, this fractal Fractal architecture will allow eventually for businesses to come up to Meta and say, hey, this is my business objective. And then Meta will automatically create a customized model in order for them to be able to automate their operational objectives. This is tremendous. Long term, this promises to make the company more money than its current advertising operation. In the meantime, however, it was interesting to see Meta distinguish between core AI and generative AI in the Q2 call. 
Certainly, much of the AI hype is yet to be materialized. But it's appealing to see Meta tell the difference between AI that's productive today and AI that may be productive tomorrow. So one of the main takeaways from the Q2 earnings report is that it seems that Meta's fungible data center infrastructure allows them to prioritize capital allocation opportunities for AI that drives value today without missing on long-term opportunities in AI that may at present not be quite as productive. So here's how Susan Lee, Meta CFO, painted this picture for investors during the Q2 2024 call. Our ongoing investment in core AI capacity is informed by the strong returns we've seen and expect to deliver in the future as we advance the relevance of recommended content and ads on our platform. While we expect the returns from generative AI to come in over a longer period of time, we are mapping these investments against the significant monetization opportunities that we expect to be unlocked across customized ad creative, business messaging, a leading AI assistant, and organic content generation. As we scale generative AI training capacity to advance our foundation models, we will continue to build our infrastructure in a way that provides us with flexibility in how we use it over time. This will allow us to direct training capacity to Gen AI inference or to our core ranking and recommendation work when we expect that doing so would be more valuable. We will also continue our focus on improving the cost efficiency of our workloads over time. The market's concern about Meta outsourcing the Llama model is, in my view, another instance of the market not being great at understanding how value is generated in networks over the long term. In this particular case, the value is not in the models themselves, but in correctly applying them to the network in question, from which participants can then proceed to extract value and Meta can capture a bit of that value too. In isolation, the model in question can do cool things, but it's of little value for you as a consumer of the platform as a business or content creator if you can't point it at a, say, 100,000 follower audience. Indeed, by open sourcing Llama and creating an ecosystem around it, Meta is increasing the odds of Llama being the best model out there. So to then maximize the value that can be unlocked by applying the model to their world-class network. Also interesting to see threads reaching over 200 million monthly active users. And more importantly, how Meta is once again patiently waiting for the app to hit 1 billion monthly active users before actually monetizing it. The point that I'm trying to make is that Meta's playbook is another instance of economies of scale shared that I was referring to in my latest video about HIMSS. This is indeed, as I have explained in the past, typical of world-class businesses today. So essentially, instead of monetizing right away, Meta is willing to to share the fruits of its scale, essentially computing power, with its users until the app in question achieves a winner-takes-all kind of scenario. I've seen the market misunderstand the concept of economies of scale shared repeatedly, and especially when applied to networks of this sort, like for example, the Uber and Spotify cases. Here's what Suck said about this in the Q2 2024 earnings call. I think that that's something that our investors and, and folks thinking about you know, analyzing the business have needed to to always grapple with is, you know, all these new products, we ship them and then there's a multi-year time horizon between scaling them and then scaling them into not just consumer experiences, but, but very large businesses. In all, Meta continues to strike me as a factory of asymmetric scenarios. Threads started off as an experiment, but now it's on course to be one of the major internet platforms. The AI data center investments they've been making over the past few years, while dampening the financials in the short term, have now given way to a fractal AI kind of setup, which could yield revenue in excess of the company's total revenue at present. Incidentally, talking about asymmetries, Reality Lab's revenue was up 28% year over year, driven by quote-unquote primarily Quest headset sales. So it seems that this part of the business, Reality Labs, is gaining some traction and could actually evolve into a new computing platform in combination with the AI infrastructure. In Q2 2024, family of apps expenses came in at $19.4 billion, accounting for approximately 80% of all total expenses. When I wrote my original deep dive, somehow the market came to believe that Meta was betting the house on the Metaverse. A brief investigation revealed that not only was this not true, but Meta was in fact investing most of its capital to supercharge its family of apps via the aforementioned development of its AI stack. This philosophy of investing most of the capital towards family of apps and by extension towards AI thus remains in place today. With the asymmetry that I point in my original deep
deep dive, which you can see in the graph below now, only beginning to unfold. When I wrote the deep dive, I pointed out that we were at T8. And now I believe we are at T9. And I wouldn't be surprised as time goes on to see the company evolve to what's depicted on the graph now as T11 and T12, where Reality Labs does actually bear fruit of a new computing platform that together with the AI infrastructure yields something very special. What kept me from investing in this business in November 2022 is my concern that Meta may be Tobacco 2.0. At that time, I broadly began to distinguish between screen time that adds value to my life or screen time that actually detracts value from it. And in my experience, Meta's platforms are so addictive that sometimes they are in the wrong camp. Sometimes they really do detract value from your life. Since I formed this view, however, Zuckerberg has proven to be an extraordinary capital allocator. And dare I say, he's proven to be an excellent capital allocator once again. And in turn, Meta has proven to have the organizational ability to simply iterate faster than anyone else. Zuckerberg made special allusion to this in the Q2 2022 earnings call. And I actually included this quote in my original deep dive, but it's worth revisiting. Let's check it out. And culturally, we focus on moving and learning faster than everyone else. And I think that those are sustainable advantages. So certainly, I think that the AI technology and infrastructure that we're building um, you know, I think it can compound and be better than others in the industry, and, and you know, that will be an advantage and make the products better over time. But I think at the end of the day, what that really comes down to is just I try to push the company to be one that learns faster and just keeps iterating and moving faster than we did in the past and, and than others in the industry do. And I think if we can do that well, then we'll continue to succeed. But I think the moment that we stop doing that, then we'll basically fall behind it. Focusing on the end customer most and iterating fastest has paid off once again, as has been the case with the companies that I've covered that possess this quality, like Spotify, Netflix, Amazon, and now in my opinion, Hims. In November 2022, the market also thought that TikTok was going to kill Meta. And many smart people were convinced of this. This case also serves as additional validation for the mental model that I teach in my Tech Stock Goldmine course. And this mental framework is also behind my successful Palantir and Spotify picks. Palantir is up 6x, Spotify is up 5x, and you guys know about my past picks like AMD, which is up 40x, Tesla, which is up 14x, and so forth. So the mental model that I teach in this course, it's behind this incredible return since I wrote my deep dive. And mind you, I didn't invest in this company, but I saw the investment opportunity clearly. And it was because of this mental framework that I teach in the course. Now, if you haven't, I recommend that you read my original deep dive, which I link to in the written form of the deep dive, which you can find in my blog. By doing so, you will clearly see the mental models that I used to spot the investment opportunity. In this way, you don't have to buy the course to take home lots of value and some very powerful tools in your pursuit of new winners. So thank you very much for joining me. I hope that you enjoyed this update. As always, can I please ask you one favor? If you enjoyed it, can you please share this with one friend whom you think will like it? These deep dives are for free, and so the only way this grows is with your help. The more you share this with other friends, the more of an incentive that I have to produce amazing content, uh, the more value you get, the better for everyone. So thank you very much. Take care, and until next time.